Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Today we have an architectural feast, uh, along with our Wednesday lunch. Um, our architectural feast has two components to it. Um, one will be a lecture by David Woodhouse, architect, um, which will follow um, a recognition ceremony of the Renneker Organ Transplant Project. Um, in July of 2010, um, Walter Whitehouse, who was then assistant university organist, came to me and said, what's going to happen to the regular <coughs> organ that is on the second floor of 5757 University um, now that the university has purchased that building and is repurposing it? I said, I don't know. Um, and what we are celebrating today is a project uh, that was embarked on by the University of Chicago to restore that organ, to ensure that it be placed in a new home. Um, amazingly, that new home, the loft space of Bond Chapel, is a perfect size with structural adaptations. Um, this was a project that was taken, uh, undertaken that was a testament and love of teamwork. Um, and so what we want to do is recognize the team here today um, and uh, then also share with you an award that the Renica Organ Transplant Project uh, has received from the American Association of Architects. That teamwork begins, however, between <coughs> the University of Chicago Divinity School and with Dean Elizabeth Davenport of Rockefeller Chapel. And I'd like to invite Elizabeth to say a few words. It's been a great partnership uh, in this project this year. It was the most wonderful thing to pick to work on. Um, actually, about two years before Walter and uh, Margie talked about this, Tom came to me. I'd probably been here all of three weeks. It was the summer of 2008. And among the very first things he said to me after I arrived on campus was, there's this organ, we're going to deal with this organ. What are we going to do with this organ? And it was the organ, of course, over in the, in the seminary, what was the seminary. Uh, so we began talking about it, and um, Walter was part of some of those conversations. But Walter's conversations with Margie were the absolutely key piece that helped make all of this happen. And it was just a magnificent partnership all the way around between us who work with chapels and organs, at the Divinity School, of which Bob Chapel is, for, of course, a contingent part, and so many offices of the university that came together to make this happen. Honestly, against all the odds, it was not cheap. Um, the Provost's office, we would not be anywhere without Tom uh, Rosenberg, who, who got this and uh, managed to sh shepherd the funding of it through. But then we assembled this wonderful team, and Margie, would you come back, and we will pull the team together and thank each of them for their work. Um, at one point, if you look at our website, you can see um, the organ pipes um, all disassembled. Um, <laughs> and if you walk into Bond Chapel today, you will see it fully reassembled in this new space. And this was a technical achievement. It was an architectural achievement. Um, but I want to also mention that it was a humanistic achievement. Um, this organ was dedicated by Betty um, Renneker in honor of her husband, Robert W. Renneker. Um, it was a memorial organ, a beautiful Baroque uh, organ. Um, Betty Renneker was a lifetime member of the University of Chicago Divinity School, uh, a, a visiting committee. Um, and so there's a living connection between our institutions. But to give you a sense of the way that each one of the people here who gave their technical specification, their particular only they could do to the project, to give you a sense of the humanistic achievement, we were upstairs in room 200 when all of a sudden we realized as we planned the inaugural concert that we could do it on February the 2nd, 2013 and that would have been Betty Renneker's 100th birthday. <laughs> and the hush in the room, and the sense that everyone had of being a part of something a lot bigger than ourselves, that crosses time, that this organ will be here long after we are, 
um, and this connection with the Renneker family. This is the kind of teamwork uh, that we had in this project. So I'd like to call forward uh, the following people who are here today. And my list is in no particular order. Sandra Peppers, Sarah Matasevic, Jose Lopez Jr., Thomas Weisswag, Cynthia Linder, Jeffrey Wilder, Alicia Murasaki, Steve Wiesenthal, Mary Jean Crado, Blair Archambault, Larry Lewin, Tara Wine, and in absentia, Thomas Rosenbaum, um, who, as has been mentioned, the provost office has been um, extraordinary in backing this project um, and in personam of Blair Archambault, among others, but without Tom Rosenbaum's support, it simply would never have happened. Um, now, I've asked each just to come forward and say a few sentences so you can get some idea of what each of these persons here contributed to this complex project that was the Renegar Oregon Transplant. Don't be shy. Tell them the truth. <laughs> and say who you are and what your title is and what you do. There. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Lewin. I am Director of Construction Management for Facility Services at the University. And I had the pleasure of working with the entire team, actually, from the third beginning of the project. Not three years prior, but <laughs> during the design phase of the project with our, our team as far as the design, uh, construction, and then the actual implementation of the work. Thank you, Larry. Jeff? Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Weiler. Our company relocated the Oregon itself. My friends have often chide me for being a bit long-winded. I won't be today, but I have to share one quick sentiment with you. On New Year's Day, I attended a party largely with a group of strangers. No one knew who I was. But one comment that I heard, and this is the absolute truth, was a comment from one of the attendees who said that the organ in Bond Chapel is the best Bach organ in Chicago. And of course, I said nothing, but I was very happy to take it. Hi, I'm Alicia Morisaki, and I'm the Executive Director for Planning and Design and Facility Services, and I contributed two pieces to the project. I asked a lot of questions during the design process, and I told David he better win an award. <laughs> I'm out of the limelight. I'm Tom Weisswag, University Organist. Apart from my initial conversation with Elizabeth, um, of course I have the great honor of being the person who plays this magnificent organ most of the time. And as I say about this organ and the one at Rockefeller Chapel, I always say to people, and it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I sat on the meetings, and um, we had wonderful uh, meetings planning the installation of this organ. And I, we each, including me, raised important questions, little details um, about uh, uh, peculiars, particulars of, of installing this organ. But it was a, a great project, and look what we have. Uh -huh. <coughs> Hello, I'm Sandra Peppers. I'm the social dean of the Divinity School. And the one action that stands out in my mind is the coordination and installation of the Bonchak chairs. <laughs> and that's getting the chairs from way south, when I say way south, I mean down south, to Chicago with delivery at 11 p.m. For the opening, <laughs> 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 so we were here. So that's the only thing I can recall. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with thanks to the women's board of the university, yes. 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 for a generous grant. Well, if you can see from my attire, especially the bullet sheet, imagine I'm on the construction site. My name is Jose Lopez, and I'm the facility services under the capital project delivery. I'm the senior project, I was a senior project manager, and there's sort of three mandates, I guess, I was given as I was given this first assignment. Number one, you see goes and tell, get it on budget. Number two, make sure it comes in on schedule. Probably the one that I valued the most was the passion behind a level of excellence to make sure that our partnerships between the Divinity School, the architect, uh, David Wilkhouse, and, and Jeff, is that we deliver a standard of excellence and <coughs> strive as best as possible to go up and beyond that. And that was the third mandate that I called to God that we achieved that. Thank you. 
My name is Sarah Matasevic, and I'm Assistant Project Manager with Facility <coughs> Services, and I worked with Jose on this project. It's brought in uh, up during construction to sort of help oversee the construction part and help support him in that thing that done. <coughs> University architect and I contributed the worst jokes about working for these I also, so Sandra, thank you for reminding us all that it wasn't just about the orchid. Um, like, have any of you ever like seen that you don't like your kitchen cabinets and you end up getting a whole new house? <laughs> chairs, the floor, the walls, you know, it, it was really, truly a, like a labor of love. How could we put the organ in the space without doing all the rest of the work? And so I really appreciate the collaboration to do do it the right way, really make it uh, so successful. And I just, while well, I have the mic, I have a question because I've been telling colleagues uh, elsewhere that we are now the only university campus with both a Baroque and Romantic organ on the same campus. Am I lying, or is that true? Uh, oh, yeah, no. yeah. There are others, but no, we, no, have, others. we have the best. best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are one of the only. How many places with a project like this, when you enjoy the chairs in Bond Chapel, you should know that the university architect sat in a dozen chairs, <laughs> <laughs> like Goldilocks, and held the side of <laughs> I'm Mary Jean Craig, oh. Director of Development for the Divinity School, and I think there are three ways in which I assisted with this project. First, uh, I think before we knew about the organ possibility, I worked with the Women's Board on developing the proposal for the chairs. Second, I helped to put together the language for the plaque. And third, I worked on the grand uh, gala concert, uh, inviting the family and planning, along with Elizabeth and Marty, that whole festival event on Betty's 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. There were some 42 members of the Reddick yeah. family and friends. Mm -hmm. Cynthia. I'm Cynthia Linder. I direct the ministry program here at the Divinity School and teach, among other things, preaching and worship. So Bond Chapel is my classroom. Uh, we've been using, I think I represent maybe the lived communities that use the chapel in all kinds of ways, as performance space, as worship space, as classroom space, as meditation space as a little jewel of a sanctuary in the midst of a busy campus. Um, and I think just all I was able to contribute to this was the imagination of how we might use that space if it was A, uh, worthy of that lovely organ with all that wonderful renovation, and B, spacious and flexible. And so for the chairs, for the lovely organ, for the shiny floors and the rehabilitated paneling, those of us who meet and listen to sermons Friday mornings are grateful. <laughs> Thank you for being Blair. Well, I'm Blair Archambault. I'm in the provost's office, and mostly I represented Tom Rosenbaum on this project. And uh, I, Marty, I, I feel that it's an important contribution is getting the money. But, but really, um, I think the team that was that's here to actually get the most out of those dollars was very impressive. And we really were able to then extend beyond the organ. And it was, since we had, well, I went in one day and saw the organ in pieces, and it was such a beautiful space that was coming out, but then we saw that there was walls and the floor, and it's like, let's try to get as much as we can out of the money that Tom was able to, to pull together for us. So, I, I mean, I really gotta congratulate the team. I personally never actually heard it, so I'm glad to see those two <laughs> Yeah, you have to come every Tuesday. Yeah, I will be there. Good. Terry, you say a word and then. I'm, I'm still Terry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I guess I was in on some of the early planning stages, but mostly I wrote about what other people did. Yeah. So that's okay. And you had to keep an eye on the plaque. That's true. On the visual yeah. on the plaque. Yes. I remember. Um, and David Woodhouse. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is David Woodhouse. I love the architectural team on the project. Or, and I like to say, 
for about 20 years, I was a super at Lyric Opera. We were the steer carrier. What they always told us was you can get out there on stage, but don't ever forget that you're just human senior. Don't, don't, we're never, never allowed to open our mouths. It's all about the sound. And in this case, I had nothing whatsoever to do about the glory, which is what the project is all about, about the sound. So it was purely visual. The, the credit for that lies in the group behind me. <clears throat> I usually don't like to edit people's remarks, but I do think one very understated contribution here is that of Jeff Weiler, um, who is the organ conservator and the organ meister, um, who brought us a, a level of both um, musical and technical expertise without which the organ function um, could not be what it is for Von Chapel. So Jeff, we're extremely grateful. Um, but without an architect, who can help design a space such that people in years to come won't walk in and say, who put that there? <laughs> and, um, and say, why or when was that done? And yet not necessarily just try to make it blend in, but to make a design statement. David Woodhouse um, is responsible for that. And so the, 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 the work today is to recognize David, our own in-house architectural team, um, and all members here um, who participated in an award that we received in the fall at the uh, American uh, Institute of Architects. Um, it is called, even without us, the Divine Detail Award. Uh, that, that has nothing to do with the Divinity School per se. It's a quotation from Mies van der Rohe, I understand, although its origins are contested. And actually, whether, whether um, God is in the details or Satan is in the details, what's said first is also disputed. Uh, but nonetheless, the Divine Detail Award is about that God is in the details, that beautiful architectural work for the city of Chicago, for the country, and for the globe rely upon that eye on beauty and detail. And so um, everyone up here has a piece of this Divine Details Award that I and Steve and, um, and Alicia, um, had, together with David, had the honor to receive at a gala event on Navy Pier in the fall. So we're bringing this award home to Swift Hall, or to, to excuse me, to Bond Chapel um, via Swift Hall. Um, and everyone up here uh, played a role in this, and the community should know um, what it's done and how it's been recognized. So maybe a round of applause to the team. Mm -hmm. Wednesday lunch uh, with a lecture today. The treat is we get to hear David Woodhouse uh, speak to us uh, out of his expertise. So, um, but I think we may not get this team together again. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll interpret that. And David, you should hold the award. Go. Can I do the architect? Can I do the Glad to play the organ. We want to demonstrate. Whoever wants to come over. 
Society for the Divine Word, and it's it's a Roman Catholic order. It's a, it was founded by it was founded in Germany. Its headquarters are of course in Rome, but its uh, American headquarters are in Technik, which is uh, in a suburb of the north side. Kind of by it's been swallowed by Northbrook. What uh, what the society did is about a hundred years ago they went out and bought you know several hundred acres of farmland, which has now become incredibly valuable uh, suburban property. And they ran a school for uh, for kids from Chicago who needed t a technical education. And so th what the, uh, the priest there told us was that the reason it's called Techni is people, with the, the students would get on the train and ride out there and the conductors would go, Techni, Techni, and they got to the spot. And that's, why, that's, that's where the name comes from. They have a very interesting collection of buildings there. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's really a kind of a dog's breakfast, a technical part. <laughs> they have, uh, in addition to the building that we worked on, they originally had an immense building. If you've ever been out there, there's a, there's a very large building up on the hill. Only one tenth of it remains. And it was originally, in plan, it was the, sh it was the dove of peace in its shape. So it always reminds me of sort of like the anti-Pentagon, <laughs> the building of peace. They also, they have a, they have a, a when, when the missionaries retire, they come back to there and they, and they spend their retirement there. And they wanted to build them a you know, retirement home. So they bought the plans for a Holiday Inn. And they built the Holiday Inn and made, made the bar into a chapel. Figured it wouldn't be the bar. <laughs> the building that we worked on, it was built in, in about 1900 as a school. And it, it had a picture. This is what it turned Oh, it works. It does. It's yeah. Um, it, the building is on the right here. It was built as a school in about 1910 or so. And then in the 50s, uh, it was wrapped in this sort of Madame Butterfly Japanese uh, gown that it, it currently wears on the, on the lower right-hand side. And it had a church chapel inside of it, uh, which is, it looked like it's the photograph on the left there. And what, what the, uh, the father, is, it was run by a, a, the head of the mission was uh, Father Presnicki, Father K, you know, he's called him. And, <clears throat> and what he wanted was a, he wanted a, a visitor center where people could come and, and learn about the activities of the missionaries around the world. And then a, a kind of a small 20-person uh, chapel that would um, not be a parish church or anything like that, but just be a sort of a wayfarer's chapel. In, in a center where, you know, a conference center where, where you can take people uh, and pray with them. And then there's a, there's a religious gift store there as well. So that was kind of the program. And where we started was we, we did a, an addition on the outside of this building that was all big translucent panels. And we used the, the uh, lights from, the, actually the runway lights from airports to light them up. Because it's on Milwaukee Avenue, and it's and it's on a it's on a very fast stretch of of, uh, of um, road, and we he wanted to make make an impression. He wanted people to 
grab people's eye. So we were we were in this in the exterior we were dealing with sort of the imagery of bright movie screens and things like that. You know, it, but there were also you know with the external structure like this, it's sort of like the buttresses, the exterior buttresses on Gothic cathedrals. And you know, he used the Father K used to joke that this was the kind of place that eventually he hoped that the Virgin's face would appear on one. <laughs> Of course, that happened under the Kennedy Expressway. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, it, was, it was an attention. It was it was a, 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 an attempt to to attract attention. The plan is is kind of a, a you know it, it was several different buildings actually built as three different buildings, none of which are on the same level, uh, none of which are the same height, vintage, anything. The, the idea is you would enter through the through the uh, addition that I just showed you and come into the visitor center, which is in the lower right, and you see what they you see the activities of the, of the missions and the missionaries around the world. And what they really do is, is they're really literal. They really they really are into printing in, 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 uh, not just printing but in, uh, preaching the word. And they they actually they're a very interesting group to me because they they are. They go to like the jungles in New Guinea, and they'll they'll print up comic books and, and uh, with, that are the Bible in, in the native languages, and they do it in, in with languages that only like 500 people still speak. And so it, they're one of the, actually one of the main reasons why these languages are preserved because they go there, learn them, you know, uh, and record them in text. So that after the, you know, some some of the languages that they've used are no longer in existence, and so they're they're the only repository left for it. But but you know they, they go out and and, uh, and then come back. And so what we wanted to do was after you got out of the visitor center, we wanted you to have this sort of moment of choice. Like now that I've seen what they do, now that I've seen what what can be done, now that I've seen why people do things. What, what should I do? And so where do you, it, the, the visitor center deposits you at this entrance, which is, which is a, a, a ramp, a, a down ramp plane that leads you to the chapel. We hope it leads you to the chapel. What, what, it's a moment of choice, though. If you go to the left, you leave. If you go to Neiman's and you shop. If you, if you go to the right, you go to the religious bookstore or uh, gift store, which is, is a good thing, too. If you go straight, you go directly into the chapel communion with God. And it's a downward ramp, partially, the, physically it's that because the floor is not aligned, but really what it's for is, is, is that so that you feel impelled, you feel some sort of force drawing you towards the chapel. The chapel you can just see in the, in the, uh, in the distance there, that sort of uh, tortured wood is the outside of the chapel. This is a view from the, from the adjacent conference room kind of structure towards the chapel itself. What the chapel is, is a wooden screen. It's about uh, 20 feet in diameter, as I said, it's very small. Um, one of the things here is that we couldn't alter the buildings at all. Uh, we couldn't change their windows, we couldn't do anything. Very low ceilings, that kind of stuff. So everything had to be an insertion. So it was kind of like, you know, that's that's how God works. It, it sort of changes your life, you insert something in your life. It was one of the things that we went through with Father K, as he told us in the, in the beginning, is, is that the Bible is, tells its Tells a story in parables. It tells you know, it tells a story to people in sort of non-verbal ways, like, like religious art does. So what we try to do is to work these parables into the design. And one of the things that he told, the other thing he told us that he, because especially because they were a Roman Catholic order, he said, I don't want any memory of Rome. I don't want any kind of <coughs> explicit quotation of, our, of religious architecture. I don't want lancet windows. I don't want you know, some Renaissance plan. A Gothic cross or a Greek cross. I don't want any of that. And it had to be very abstract. So what we came up with was this sort of wooden screen. And it's a it's a circular it's a circular thing. We thought of it as a basket. When he first saw it, he said, "It's wonderful. It's like the huts we preached." It was it was those kinds of memories. On the outside of it, it's very tortured. It's it's uh, it's it's a cacophony of, of sharp angled boards. It's all made of pine and cherry. And it's, it's, it's very, very nubby. And, 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 uh, looks like it'll hurt you on the outside. That's, that's to represent sort of the, you know, the life without God's presence. It's, it's struggle, it's, it's pain, it's, you know, it's things like that. Inside, it's all smooth. It's, it's serving. 
The other thing that we did is, is we covered the exterior windows on the, the right-hand side of this, product, this photograph here with screens that were uh, hand-sanded plexiglass, sorry, that would block the windows and, and take the light from the outside and make it diaphanous. So that we, wanted, we wanted it to be permeated by, by the light of the word. So those are the two sort of systems in this photograph, like the nothingness of the wood and the, and the, and the light. Then when you approach the chapel, this, this is the, the entryway into the chapel, you, you kind of see it obliquely, sort of gestures to you, but you can see how inside it's it sort of smooths out. It, it, Father King was also very interested in imagery like, you know, Jesus was a carpenter, his craft, his, his, uh, you know, it's, it's handmade and all that stuff. It's also, it, it looks like it's very cacophonous, but it was actually made of 18 different boards, board shapes. It's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and they all fit together in a certain way. So it has, a, it has a, does have a construction project of its own. Inside, this is this is the um, this is looking towards the altar area. The floor inside is sizal. It's it's like a doormat, so that when you stand on it, it's kind of not quite stable. It's you know, you really know where you are. Except over in the, in the uh, in the more sacred area, which which is uh, is black concrete. We wanted to make it marble, but he said, you know, David, I can't stand on this floor and ask for money and have it be marble. So so all of the all of the materials are are, are, are very humble, very very human, not special. And when you walk into the chapel from the from the um, sacred side. You can see that the inside is all of these boards is all is all serene. And there are, what what they are is they're they're pine boards which are separated by about a quarter of an inch and they're they're they have cherry wedges stabbed through them. And it, it, it makes a sort of a board space, board space, board space. So the thing is a screen, so the light actually comes through it. And um, then in the ceiling. It's a very short space. It's only about 10 feet. It's not even 10 feet tall. It's about nine and a half feet tall. Father Krasinski himself was six foot nine, so he was a very tall man. And so, we, and we couldn't change any of that. So, but we still wanted to do something on the, on the ceiling. So, we came up with these panels of kind of cut plywood, cut finished plywood. And there were, in discussions with Father K, there were a lot of readings of, about what they what they were. They were kind of like clouds. They were kind of like being under trees. They were, you know, they were, they were kind of like a lot of things. And they were kind of like a lot of the places where the missionaries preached, which is, which is what you wanted. They're really, though, based, the shapes of them are based on the dome at uh, San Andrea della Valle in Rome, where we took the, the, the big Baroque painting on the dome and kind of separated it into different layers. And I don't know whether you can see this, but if you, if you know the code, you can, you, can, you can see like a prophet's hands. So. This is a close-up of it. Back in, in the lower left corner, you can see that circle. That's a chair of the week. And it's, the way it works is that, is that it's very close to you when you're standing, and it's very difficult to read. But in the Catholic liturgy, liturgy when you kneel, you are getting distance from the ceiling, and you can look back up on it, and, and the pattern becomes a little bit more, you know, more more legible. Then one of the things that I, I thought was really interesting as, a, as an architect, this was a learning moment for me, um, was that you know we built the chapel walls I guess, as these as these spaces. So that, you know as I said, it's board air, board air. And one of the reasons, one of the things we were we were trying to do with that was to use that as a means for having the chapel take on life, because. Uh, you know, it's not a parish church or anything, so it won't it won't get that incrustation of life that you see in, in, in older churches where generation after generation after generation make changes in plaques and things, you know, so you can see the community there. That would never happen here. It's a different kind of community. And so what we were hoping was that, and, and he does this, is that he takes the slots and, and say on Easter he drapes uh, white satin through them. And Palm Sunday, he puts palms in there. He uses them. It's sort of like slot wall in a store. You know, it's, it's, it's a means of, 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 of enlivening, the of use of decorating the church. But the really interesting decoration that came along was when the church, when the chapel opened, Father K wrote a sermon 
uh, about it, uh, kind of illustrating the parables. And it was, it was just as the wood is like this, you know, it was sort of like that. And he wrote this long sermon, which was his, his inaugural sermon. And he, he um, Xeroxed that onto different different colored papers, and he left a stack of it in the uh, in the chapel. And he walked in one day, and, and somebody had taken one of these one of these papers and wedged it in in the, in the, in the wood in, in one of the cracks. And he thought, you know, oh damn, somebody's done something I don't want, so I'll go over and pick it out. And he unrolled it, and it was a prayer. It was that there was there was a guy who was being sent to prison for having embezzled from his company, and he wrote a prayer to God to take care of his children and his wife who was, was incarcerated. And it was like, you know, okay, that's pretty that's pretty amazing. And so he left it. And within a week, the, the walls were completely covered. Because the, the, the people who go there, it was like one of those moments where it's something that, that as an architect, something that you had not designed, but you had left open to completion by the users was you know, amazingly valuable. So we always, it's hard to try to do that. <coughs> so that's all I brought. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. were really an, a, partially it was allusion to Jesus being a carpenter. Partially it was allusion to building your life. It was it was a it was a celebration of craft, of, of you know hands, hands and material. It was also a, 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 we were trying to purposely, as I said, to use humble materials. Things I mean they they actually are two by sixes. You know, they just buy them in the laundry room. They're they're not precious. They, this was there wasn't any overt kind of recyclable material. I mean, we were trying to use all natural materials that that, that had God's stamp on them. You know, that were not man-made. There are some some of the ceiling, like like over the ceiling in, in the um, sacred area, is galvanized metal, which is a man-made thing. But um, most of it is was sort of grown in the natural natural. Sense. David, can you say a bit more about your collaboration with Father K and sort of what the idea stream was in terms of his vision for this and your vision and how I mean, how much of the metaphorical resonances that you just described were, you know, he had already and said, I want you to design something that will enact these and how much are the, are are yours, and how much are just impossible without either one of you being together? Um, we're talking about the teamwork mm -hmm. of the project <laughs> as it unfolded, because you you explained it with such uh, eloquence mm -hmm. about the meaning of the space, and so I'd love to know your thoughts on the teamwork, and then also sort of for whom are you speaking now as you execute this space? Well, you know. Architecture is is only a team sport. I mean, you know, when I was in school, you, I'm sure you've all seen the movie The Fountainhead or read the book at one point. And I had a, I had a professor who told me that Howard Bork said architecture back 150 years. I, I didn't know what he meant, but I do now because it, it's not an authorial thing. Someone maybe needs to make a judgment in the end using expertise, but it's it's a, it's an extremely open-ended contact. You know, everybody. Everybody has a say because everyone knows something. Uh, kind of an activity. It's, it's, it's not an authorial genius sketch kind of kind of thing. And um, in working with Father K, I was not raised as a, as a Catholic, so I, I, I obviously don't have any sort of background like he did for sure. But it, it was it was a it was a back and forth because he would tell us certain things that that he wanted to see. You know, could you could you find a form? That would that would have this idea in it, or we would show him a form, not knowing that an idea was in it, and he would like like the thing about the huts. When when we showed it to him, that was his first comment. It's great. It's like the huts. We we, we teach him. I didn't know that. 
because I don't actually know, I didn't pre-know uh, where he taught me. So, you know, there, there's this back and forth about this. And we, we used to laugh about it, that, you know, that when we were finished, he could get an architectural degree, and perhaps I could struggle with the divinity degree. <laughs> <laughs> really have to think to say that in this room. You know, but there, there, was a, there was a lot of learning, and, and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's kind of like the, the, the papers. You know, people see things in your work that you didn't see. And you, of course, say, oh, I knew that. But you didn't. And, and it's a, you know, I've never taken any, I guess I'm stupid, but I've never taken anybody to one of my projects who wasn't able to point out something about it that I felt was true and I didn't know it. And, it's, and, it, and that's what you go through, as, as you know from the, from the Renick or Oregon project. That's what you go through as, as a design team. You try to lead a process by which those kinds of synergies come together. And at the end, you really can't say whose idea it was. And, and I think in an authorial sense, it really doesn't matter. You know, it's just that, that they all get out there, they get judged, and they get, they get reified. Well, let me say on behalf of the school again, thank you to each of you for coming. And thank you to the members of the team for um, adding this to your busy schedule. Um, all those who would like to come to the chapel now to hear Tom play and to get a close look, um, please do. Um, but it remains especially to thank our speaker, David Woodhouse, for a really um, insightful and keen look at the uh, Techie Towers project. For David, thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.